الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد ما جاء brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We begin by reminding ourselves that we should have taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa taala, which means that we should be conscious of Allah. We should consciously rem- or continuously remember Allah. We should fear Allah, and we should protect ourselves from His punishment. As he tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. He says, O oh, you who believe, have taqwa in Allah as he's worthy of having taqwa in. And don't allow yourself to pass away except that you're in a state of Islam or a state of loving submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on this blessed day of Jum'ah, when our salawat are shown to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we ask Allah to send an abundance of peace and prayers upon him. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik wa an'am ala Habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Ma ba'd. There are several places in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the story of birth or the story of a baby. And oftentimes it's fascinating when you look at these trends in the Qur'an because when you look at them collectively as a trend, they tend to draw out 
layers of new lessons that you may not have reflected on before. And so I want to start today's khutbah with a reminder of some of these stories. Perhaps one of the most famous one is the story of Maryam alayhi salam giving birth to Isa alayhi salam. Mary giving birth to Jesus. May God be pleased with them both. And we're told in the Quran that Allah commands Maryam through wahi, through some sort of inspiration to drive away from her people and go somewhere eastbound so that she can give birth in secret. And when Maryam is aware of what's happening, that although she hasn't been unchaste, she's never been with a man, somehow she has a baby in her womb. She's concerned. Firstly, how is she going to give birth to this baby? Secondly, what in the world is happening to me? And thirdly, what are people going to say when they see me with a new baby? Where am I going to go after this? And Allah hears her worries and her concerns, and He sends another wahi telling her, don't worry. As for the first concern, what's happening to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills what He wants, and Allah will that this baby come into the world now. And as for your concern of how you're going to give birth, then go to the east, find a date tree, find shade underneath it. If you feel any hunger, shake it and food will fall to you. And he had some water run underneath her to help her deliver. Now so for those of you who have seen a baby being born, you see what it takes in today's world, how many people are required. Can you imagine Maryam alayhi salam by herself in the desert, completely unaware of what's happening, being told, just go under a tree, and if you get hungry, shake it, and you'll be okay. And she does it. And this baby is born beautiful and healthy. And as for the third concern, about how am I going to go back to my people, Allah tells her, you are now fasting, you are not to speak. If they ask you about him, or they scorn you because of him, just point to the baby. Now I ask you again, Put yourself in Maryam's shoes. What is the baby going to be able to do? The whole reason they're going to be scorning me is this child. What can this little baby do? And Allah tells us when she goes back to her people and they begin to blame her and they begin to accuse her of all sorts of indecency, she does not speak. She simply points to him and the baby speaks. And he tells them who he is and where he came from and what his mission is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took her three concerns and answered them. And we'll come back in a moment, but I want to run through two more stories very quickly. Another famous story of a birth in the Qur'an is the birth of Musa alayhi salam. But Allah tells us about it a little bit after he's born. And what's fascinating to keep in mind is that when Allah brings this story up in the Qur'an, He brings it up to Musa when Musa is worried about his mission. Allah tells Musa, go to Fir'aun. Musa says, Ya Allah, I'm worried. Allah says, don't worry, I've been with you before. And then Allah tells him the story. That you were born in a year when you were to be killed. The children of Bani Israel were by edict of Fir'aun to be murdered in that year. And so your mother was worried that you were going to be killed. And we sent her a wahi. This mother worried that her child would be murdered by the state. It's wahid, it's told by Allah, throw him into the river. And not only that, when you throw him into the river, he's not going to drown, but he's going to be carried to the very man who's supposed to kill him. And she does it. And exactly what she was told would happen, happens. He gets carried to the house of Fir'aun, and a few days later, under the protection of Fir'aun, Musa is brought back to his mother. She's told again, I know what your concern is. Here's what you're supposed to do, and don't worry. Finally, the third story and the last one I'll mention is the story of Ismail alayhi salam and Hajar alayhi salam. When Ibrahim alayhi salam, after decades of waiting for a child, is commanded, take your wife and your newborn baby into the desert and leave them there. And Ibrahim does it. And as he's walking his way away, his wife asks him, why are you doing this? And he can't even bring himself to respond. And then she says, does Allah, did Allah tell you to do this? 
And he indicates yes, and immediately it's as if there's no more concern. She says, go, we are in no need. Allah will be with us. But when the pangs of hunger begin to force Ismail to cry out like any sane human being, she begins to feel that concern and that worry. And she has no source of food, no source of water, no source of protection. You all know the story. She begins to run from mountain to mountain seven times until Allah rules that Jibreel strikes the earth under Ismail's feet and Zemzem begins to pour out. Again, her concerns are answered. Allah says, just trust, your concerns will be answered. Now what's fascinating to me about these stories, and why I wanted to open with them today, there's a lot of lessons you can pull for them, no doubt. But I want to focus on one clear trend and aspect and reminder that comes from these stories. And that is the reminder of tawakkul of reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's fascinating because Allah seems to pick the weakest moment that a human being can experience in the world. And I'll tell you what I mean. Especially for those of you who've had children or witnessed children being born. Allah is talking about the female of the species in these stories. None of these stories. The hero in these three stories is not the men. It is the women. It is the physically weaker of the species, regardless of what the modern world wants to tell us. On average, women are way weaker than men physically. And they're far more vulnerable to the harms of the world than men are. And yet here you have them, these weaker of the species showing tremendous strength and power. And not only that, Allah tells us about their story in their weakest of moments. Maryam, when she's giving birth, Allah says about birth giving in the Quran that your mother carried you wahman ala wahm, weakness after weakness after weakness. And for those of you again who've witnessed childbirth, you know what the ayah is talking about. Child rearing, holding a child in your stomach, in your womb, and having them there for months on end, and then trying to deliver them into the world takes everything out of the body of a woman. Most women can no longer control their own bodies. They can't sit comfortably. Food, their food is not enough intake for them because the child keeps sucking the nutrients. They can't sleep normally. They're drained, they're fatigued. And then when they actually go into labor, they have almost nothing of their strength left. Quite often you find them, even if the birth is an easier birth, you find the power draining from their body with every contraction. And in this weakest of moment, Allah tells Maryam, Allah tells Hajar, Allah tells the mother of Musa alayhi salam jami'an, have trust in Allah and Allah will be there with you and they trust in Him and Allah is there with them. And not only that, in all three instances, a miracle is brought out of this tawakkul. They went in with deep concerns. Well, for Maryam, it was a miraculous childbirth. And then the miraculous speaking of a child. Two miracles to respond to her concerns. For the mother of Musa, two miracles. Throw him into the river, he'll survive. And then I'll bring him back under the protection of the very one who you were running from. And for Hajar alayhi salam, another miracle. Not only will you be okay, this water will bring forth a new civilization and your very offspring will be the khatm of the anbiya. It will be the final messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's as if Allah is telling us, telling humanity, real tawakkul comes out when you are at your complete weakest point. But real tawakkul can produce enormous miracles. Real tawakkul comes out when you are at your weakest point. And when you have real tawakkul, Allah can produce enormous miracles. In fact, many of our ulama say, tawakkul, reliance on Allah, and I'll let me define it very quickly and then move on. Tawakkul, when I use this phrase, I'm going to use it over and over because there's no good equivalent for it in English. Tawakkul means that you trust and rely on Allah. That's what it means in basic terms. The mother of Mary has all these concerns. Don't worry. Yes. The normal way the world works, it's not going to do you any good. But trust in Allah, I'll take care of you. That's tawakkul. 
to rely and trust in Allah. Real tawakkul by ulama say is directly and inextricably linked to two things. One is a proper understanding of tawheed. And I'll come back to this later. A proper understanding of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But number two, a proper understanding of your relationship to Allah. Antimul fuqara'u in Allah, wallahu ghani. You are in complete need of Allah, and Allah is in need of no one. When you understand that, you understand that you are completely weak and helpless without Allah. And that Allah needs nothing from you, and nothing from the whole of humanity, and nothing from the whole of creation, then your tawakkul is complete. One needs to remember, just like Maryam had to realize, again, I want you to think about this for a moment, a woman alone in the desert, having never been with a man, there's no husband, no father, no one to be with her, completely alone, being told by some inspiration, just trust in Allah. How weak and helpless was she in that moment? But how complete then is her tawakkul? Completely helpless, but how perfect is her tawakkul? Hajar alayhi salam left completely helpless. No man to take care of her, no civilization around her. In fact, this was Ibrahim's dua when he left them. The Quran tells us Ibrahim looks back and says, Ya Allah, I left my family in a place, there's no human being around them. What are they going to do by themselves? Complete helplessness. But in that moment of complete helplessness, perfect reliance comes out. Because in those moments when you are at your complete weakest, is when you truly realize, I am faqir, I am in need of Allah, and Allah is ghani, Allah is in need of no one. Allah is in control of everything. And so it's as if Allah in the Quran over and over and over again is trying to remind us, you are going to face a lot of circumstances in your life where you are reminded of your weakness. But the point is to then perfect your tawakkul, perfect your reliance on Allah. You actually have no control. I actually have no control. The things within our realm of control is very small. It is essentially my intention and my choice of action. That's it. All of Islam reduced to that. What is your intention in every moment? And what is your choice of action in every moment? You actually control nothing else. You don't control how you were born. You don't control your skill sets. You don't control your strengths and weaknesses. You don't control how much money you're going to make. You don't control who your parents were or where you were born. None of this is in your control. All you can control is, is my new or sincere? And am I making the right choice of action? Not even the action, because for the action to happen, you have to rely on Allah. Is my niya sincere? And am I making the best choice of action? That's your entirety of control. And even then, even in that, you will not be guided to sincere intention and correct action without the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is reminding us in the Quran over and over again. You are weak, but in that weakness comes out your greatest strength. And that is your reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why tawakkul, as the ulama say, is at the heart of every single prophetic story in the Qur'an. No matter what story you read or reflect on, you will find tawakkul there. You will find reliance on Allah there. You will find the prophets over and over again in a state of complete weakness and helplessness. But then their strength comes out and their reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I reference Musa alayhi salam telling Allah, how am I going to go back to Fir'aun? How powerful is he and how weak am I? And not only that, I actually murdered someone in Egypt. If I go back, he has a legal right to take my life. And Allah tells him, don't worry, I'm with you. Ya Allah, you, you burst me, you created me with a speech impediment. How am I going to speak? Don't worry, I took away your speech impediment. They will understand you and just to give you some comfort, here's Harun with you. Ya Allah, these magicians, they have the power to amaze and confound and confuse the masses. And Allah says, don't worry, just throw your staff. And He does. And it destroys their magic in an instance. We are put through these moments of weakness and concern and worry to remind ourselves of our greatest strength. And that is, my strength and your strength 
is only as strong as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to be. Our strength is really only in how much we rely and how perfectly we rely on Allah. So Allah reminds us in the Quran, just as that woman goes into birth and has no power. You know what's fascinating to reflect on? I don't know how many of you know, but I know of at least three or four stories, people that I know directly, who tried for more than a decade to get pregnant and couldn't. And they paid enormous amounts of money for all the modern science to try to give them a baby, and it couldn't do a thing. And then as soon as they gave up, and I know at least three couples like this, as soon as they gave up and said, Khalas, we left our amr to Allah, within a few months, subhanAllah, they're pregnant. And many of them have since been pregnant multiple times. And this is because Allah says that only Allah knows what happens in the womb. Now I work with a lot of doctors. Some of, my, some of the people I work with are OBGYNs. And they tell me themselves, I swear to you, we have no control. We don't know what's going to happen. What we can tell you is the probabilities of what will happen. But we actually don't know. When my own children were in the womb of their mother, and we would get these tests back that would give us a percentage of genetic concern, and I would speak to the doctor, the same answer, we actually don't know. I can give you the probabilities, perfectly possible your child comes out healthy, perfectly possible they come out and they're completely sick and they're going to live a miserable, illness-filled life. We don't actually know. We can just give you probabilities. That whole process of childbirth, you will have no control over it, none whatsoever. And you are completely weak. And at the same time, how many of us have a memory more hopeful and more beautiful and more beloved to us than when we were told our child was finally conceived or when our child came into the world? Even for the non-believer, Allah links these two realities. When you are at your most helpless, you are actually at your most hopeful because you are in the grasp and in the hudan, in the hug of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ الْعَظِيمِ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَيَا فَوْزَ الْمُسْتَغْفِرِينَ اسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا أما بعد I do want to highlight something that must be highlighted every time we talk about توكل because it's it's a problem that's so pervasive that even Umar alayhi salam way back among the Sahaba had to correct it. It's a very well-known story of Umar where he, uh, when he was a Khalifa, he came to know of two brothers who would spend their time in the masjid all day, worshiping Allah, reading Quran, making dua. And so he asked them, like, where do you get your wealth from? Where do you get your, your welfare from? How do you take care of yourselves? And they said, you know, we relied on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the famous Umar way, with his stick, Umar lovingly hit them. And he said, this isn't tawakkul, this is tawakkul, this isn't reliance on Allah, this is undue sort of hopefulness that Allah will give you. In another famous statement, Umar says, care for your provisions in the world, and don't just sit in the mosque, and pray to Allah that He give you provisions when you know Allah didn't create this world where gold and silver fall from the sky. Allah created asbab, Allah created rules in this earth. And we follow those rules because that's what Allah wants from us. Meaning, yes, 100%, we have no control. You can work 24 hours a day, 7 days a week for a decade straight and still be dead broke at the end. And there are people who work very little. I know because I see them. They work very little, playing golf multiple times a week, or basketball multiple times a week, or playing video games. And somehow an hour of their time produces millions upon millions of dollars. Because the rizq at the end of the day, completely in the hands of Allah. It's not directly tied to how smart you are, how hard you work, that's all a fallacy. And yet, we are commanded by Allah and we are praised by our Prophet if we work to feed ourselves and our family. Because that's what Allah loves. Take the asbab. Do your best with the means Allah gives you, but then know fully that it's ultimately in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so to, to define tawakkul appropriately, one has to know 
the rakul is to balance between doing everything you can with your limbs, but knowing your heart, my limbs don't matter. It's all up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of the day, what I do is only for the pleasure of Allah. It's not for the, the food it's going to produce. And I'll just remind you of this, all three stories have it, but I'll go through just one of them very quickly. The story of Maryam, most of the ulama very famously comment on this. That 30 or 40 men together shaking a date palm tree may not be able to make the fruit fall because of how sturdy and strong that tree is. But Allah commands Maryam in the Qur'an, if you're worried, shake it. And the ulama remind us over and over again, what is her shaking going to actually do? It does nothing. The point from Allah is, do what you can. What was Hajar doing running between those mountains seven times? What was she actually doing? What was going? She went back and forth. What was she really going to see on the horizon other than perhaps a mirage? But you do what you can. And Allah so loved that effort from Hajar that any one of us who wants to do Umrah or Hajj has to go back and repeat it because of how complete it was in its tawakkul. So to have proper tawakkul is to do your part. Or as one of the ulama said, he said that zuhud, like this, this idea of being detached from the world is not to hate the dunya, it's not to hate money. And it's not to squander your wealth. Rather, zuhud is to have the proper tawakkul. And then he defined it. He said it is to know that all of your striving and all of your care over your dunya does not produce your dunya for you. You trust in Allah's hand more than you trust in your hand. That's what the Adam said. You trust in Allah's hand more than you trust in your hand. Now I want to come back to a point I referenced in the first khutbah. Tawakkul cannot be disassociated from or delinked from a proper tawheed, a proper belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have a unified belief in Allah is to know that everything belongs to Allah. And so if everything belongs to Allah, what do I have to worry about? And so as one of my shiyukh used to say, tawakkul is born, it's born out of a transformed consciousness. It's when your thought process of the world transforms to where you know my past, my future, my circumstances, they're all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They came from him, not from me. And he remains in control. Because he is alone in his ubudiyah. As the ulama say, that's why the sajda is the, is the mark of Islam. The sajda that we're about to do is the symbol of Islam and Islam alone. Because in Islam, you have this purity of faith. Nothing is worthy of your concern, of your striving, of your worry, other than Allah's rida. So have your heart Sajid to Allah, have your heart in a state of prostration only to Allah and real tawakkul will come out. Because you know Allah is in complete control and not me. But tawakkul then brings out a transformed existence in this world. You know tawakkul I mentioned is at the heart of every prophetic story in the Quran. Tawakkul, real tawakkul brings true contentment with the world. Because tawakkul allows you to say, whatever has passed was from Allah. Where I am today is from Allah. I have to take my sins, meaning I may have made some mistakes, I have to correct my mistakes. But ultimately, the circumstances are from Allah. And so I can be pleased that Allah put me where I am. Tawakkul produces contentment. That same understanding brings you ease and peace. Because tawakkul also lets you know, I don't need to worry about the future. I'll plan, but I don't need to worry about it because it's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I may be here tomorrow, I may not. And if I am, Allah will take care of me. I may not always see it, just like Maryam couldn't see how this baby was going to defend her, just like Hajar couldn't see how she would be fed and taken care of, just like the mother of Musa couldn't see how Fir'aun would bring back her child to her. They didn't have to worry about it because they knew Allah is in control. I don't need to know how He's going to do it, but He will. So tawakkul brings ease and peace into your heart. But tawakkul also gives you courage. Because tawakkul lets you know, as long as I'm standing with Allah, it does not matter who stands against me. It does not matter who thinks I'm backwards. It does not matter who likes me or hates me. 
As long as I stand with Allah, I'm with the one in true control. The superpowers of the earth can point their drones at me, and it doesn't matter because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remains in control of those drones ultimately. And please, dear brothers, move up, inshallah. We'll be done soon, but we want to make sure that there's space for everyone, inshallah. And finally, tawakkul produces a deep sense of resolve and hope. Because a person with real reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a person who can never be in a state of despair. Even if you go through failure after failure after failure after failure, you know ultimately Allah remains in control. In this world or the next, I will have Allah's pleasure with me. I want to very quickly go over a few things. Just two answers, or two questions that I think may come up. We'll answer them quickly and we'll end inshallah. A lot of times people have questions about what are the signs, like how do I know if I have a proper tawakkul? I'll give you a few that some of my teachers gave me over the years. Very quickly I'll go through them inshallah. Number one, if your remembrance of Allah at least stays the same, but better than that increases during difficulty, then you're in a state, or it's a sign that you're in a state of tawakkul. So things get hard, you lean into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not run away from Him. Number two, even if your situation gets bleaker, your hope does not fade. That's actually one of the biggest signs of tawakkul. As the situation seems to get worse and worse, I know my hope just keeps to increase more and more. Because ultimately I know I'm with Allah. Number three, you never revert to sin to get out of a problem. Because you know, ultimately it's Allah. I cannot sin, for if I sin, He may not be with me any longer. Number four, you are never excessive in your anxiety or your fear about the future. Everyone has some concern. It's impossible not to. We are human beings, we were created like this by Allah. But to have an excessive fear of the future, of death, of a sickness, of poverty, that's a sign of a weak tawakkul. And lastly, if you find yourself striving with your limbs, with all that you can, that's a sign of your tawakkul in Allah SWT when it's coupled with a submitted heart. But I want to wrap up with three challenges that I see today to tawakkul. This is really why I wanted to bring it up, but I got a little carried away with talking about tawakkul, inshallah, there was some benefit in it. But I'll quickly go through them. There are three primary challenges the world gives us in having a proper tawakkul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first is that we live in an overly materialistic age. Most of us, from the faces in front of me, have probably been in this country for decades. If you're like me, you were born and raised here. You don't know anything else but this world, but this country specifically. And as beautiful as New Jersey's nature walks are, we live in a very fabricated world. We don't live in nature. We live in a world that has been tamed by man to a great extent. And the farther and more you use these creations of man, the more subconsciously you forget that Allah is ultimately in control. But worse than that, we live in an age that tells you that your entire strength, self-worth, goodness comes from your ability to produce results on the earth. Whether it be how much money you make or how fancy or uh, flashy your career is, that's where you're going to bring some value into this world. And Allah SWT mentions this in the Quran in Surah Alaq. Verily, indeed, man transgresses whenever he finds himself in a state of richness because you begin to think that you actually have control. But this is directly linked to the second major challenge. And I see it in a lot of young American Muslims today. The modern world has changed our definition of purpose. See, historically, even if you were Muslim, but definitely if you were, your purpose in life was directly linked to your God and your family, your tribe. It wasn't linked to your career. It wasn't linked to your money. It wasn't linked to the house that you buy or the car that you drive. It wasn't linked to how flashy you can seem to your friends. It was linked, even to those who weren't good Muslims or weren't Muslim at all, it was linked to something greater than yourself. And oftentimes that manifested itself in a religious belief. And when your purpose gets subverted, what comes directly after it is increased anxiety. 
because absolutely nothing can fill the soul like the ubudiyya to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As soon as you remove Allah from your soul, from your heart, from your purpose, you begin to immediately increase in anxiety. And you can see this in the way the world talks about itself today. How many of your friends, Muslim or non, who are devoted to a career, or devoted to an image, have a peaceful heart? And how many of them, whenever you sit with them, are constantly speaking of their misery or their anxiety or their concerns? Because as soon as you remove Allah as a purpose, all that's left is anxiety because you have no control over anything. And neither does anyone else that you're sitting with. And then lastly, the victimhood Olympics that we put ourselves through. We live in a culture where it has become very posh, very en vogue, to constantly talk about all the ways things are horrible and bad for you. How much does the world oppress me? How much do I feel left out? How much does TV not represent me? How much does the streaming service not have actors and so on that don't look like me or don't sound like me? And with every complaint, you wash away more and more and more of your tawakkul and your hope. And that's why in Surah Al-Duha, when Allah finds the Prophet in a state of concern and worry, His response is to recount all of the ways Allah has already helped him. And then Allah tells him, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثِ And speak often of the blessings of your Lord. Because when you speak about them, when you verbalize them, they renew your sense of hope and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you and I from those who hear what is said and follow the best of it. Oh Allah, all thanks and praise are due to you until you are pleased with us. And all thanks and praise are due to you if you become pleased with us. Ya Allah, forgive us our sins and accept from us our repentance. Oh Allah, we ask of you Jannah and we seek refuge in you from the hellfire. Oh Allah, please send an abundance of peace and prayers upon our beloved Muhammad. O you who turns the hearts, keep our hearts steadfast on Islam. Make beloved to us everything that is beloved to you and make hated to us everything that is hated to you. Ya Allah, we ask that you be with our brothers and sisters in Gaza. Ya Allah, be with our brothers and sisters in India. Ya Allah, be with our brothers and sisters in China. Ya Allah, be with our brothers and sisters in Egypt and in Burma and in Yemen. Ya Allah, be with our brothers and sisters everywhere they are oppressed and use us to alleviate their suffering and do not allow us to be a means of increasing their suffering. O oh Allah, guide us, guide this country through us and make us a means for this country to be guided. Wa akhiru da'wan, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa aqam as salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah, hayya ala salati, hayya ala al-falah, qad qamati salatu, qad qamati salah, الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله straighten the rows fill the gaps inshallah and please complete every row in front of you before you start a new one inshallah and in this message it's a little unique because of the length so please make sure that the rows are completed all the way to your right, inshallah, before you start a new one. Turn your hearts towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pray as if it's your last chance before He takes you to meet Him. Allahu Akbar. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar Rahmanir Rahim. Maliki Yawmid Deen. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد الله أكبر
Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Elrahmanirrahim. Maliki yevmiddin. İyyâke na'budu ve iyyâke nesta'in. Ehdinas sıratal mustakîm. Sıratal lezîne en'amte aleyhim. Gayril mağdûbi aleyhim velad dâllîn. Âmîn. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kul huve Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمد الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله